It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker, and welcome back. It's good to be back here, I think. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Uh, I've Throughout the break, I was traveling all around this province, and it's pretty clear that uh, people all across this province are hurting right now. Uh, they're feeling the rising cost of everything from utilities to mortgage payments, groceries, uh, rent. And for workers in our hospitals, in our schools, and in the broader public sector speaker, they've also had to contend with their own government fighting to suppress their wages with Bill 124 and then with the costly legal battle and campaign to defend that bill. But, Speaker, the workers won. And the courts have ruled once again that Bill 124 was unconstitutional. It was an unconstitutional attack on the rights of working people and their paychecks. Question. And so my question to the Premier is, will he apologize to Ontario's hardworking nurses PSWs, teachers, educational assistants, and all the public sector workers for suppressing their wages with Bill 124. Members, please take their seats. To respond, the Premier. Sure, it's great to be back in, in the House here, and it's so nice to see everyone. You know, maybe maybe I'll start with the cost of living. Uh, the leader of the opposition went around the province, she said, and looked at the cost of living. Well, let's tell your constituents and everyone in Ontario that you voted against the one fare that we, we put forward that saves people $1,600 a year. She voted against getting rid of the license sticker fee. Again, voted against reducing tax, the, the gas tax by 10.7 cents. She voted against getting rid of the, the tolls on the 412 and 418. So I don't think the, the Leader of the Opposition really, really cares about the people and, and making sure that they keep the costs down, taxes down, because she's voted constantly against us Order. reducing the tax. Let's talk about health care. There's no government in the history of this country, not to mention the province, that is spending a $81 billion a year. That's up wow. over $20 billion since 2018. In the Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the Leader of the Office. Speaker, you know what we voted against? We voted against Bill 124. Yeah, yeah. And we told this government it was unconstitutional. And I'll tell you, Premier, that did not sound like an apology to me, no. uh, Speaker. The government not only used their power to cut the wages of healthcare and education workers yeah. during a pandemic. They spent uh, untold amounts of dollars fighting those workers in court yeah. for years, only to be told what we already all knew. The bill is and always was unconstitutional, Speaker. So through you again to the Premier, do over. How much did this government spend on legal costs to keep down workers' wages on Bill 124? Sure. Members will please take their seats. Premier. What we've done for the health care workers, which we think the world of, we think the world of the nurses, as the Leader of the Opposition voted against the $7,000 bonus that we gave the nurses, she must not have cared about the nurses. But the nurses, you know something? The nurses out there were paying for the education of new nurses, and obviously there's a huge take-up because we set another record of 17,500 nurses registered last year. We've seen over 80,000 nurses register in this province in the last five years. Over 10,400 doctors have registered. We've added more seats, 449 postgraduate uh, seats, 260 undergraduate seats. We're building new medical universities that have been built in decades, Mr. Speaker. As the, as the Liberals froze health care funding, we increased it $21 billion. As they slashed physician services, and cut residency uh, seats. We've added them. We've added over 3,500 beds. We're going to add another 3,000 beds. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I guess we'll find out eventually, one way or another, how much it cost. But, Speaker, Bill 124 deteriorated conditions in hospitals, in long-term care facilities at the worst possible time. Yeah. 
We were already struggling with rampant hallway medicine when this government came into power, and they managed to make things even worse. Burned out nurses, health care workers have been leaving the sector in droves, right? They can't get out of here fast enough with this government in power. And guess what, Speaker? Private nursing agencies, the friends of this government, they've been easy, uh, readily ready to jump in and fill the gap, bleeding our hospitals dry at the same time, and demanding exorbitant fees for exactly the same work. So, Speaker, back Question. to the Premier. Will he admit his choices worsened the crisis facing our health care system and once and for all, please, apologize to Ontarians for Bill 124? Members will please take their seats. And the Premier. Speaker, I find this so ironic. Their government, the NDP government, supported the Liberals. They fired 1,600 nurses. We've registered 17,500, 80,000 since we've been in office. We're, we're building 50 Order. new hospitals, I said, and, and either building them or expanding the hospitals, adding 3,000 beds. We're going to add another 3,500 beds when these new hospitals go up. But one of the, one of the best was a couple of weeks ago, when my Minister of Health added $110 million to connect 300,000 more patients to family physicians. And by the way, it's the lowest in the, in the country. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue investing into health care. Just the pharmacies alone served over 700,000 people that didn't have to go to the primary care box in less than a year. That's what we're doing for health care. As they continue to vote against health care, we continue to fund it and expand health care. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, um just consider for a moment, Speaker, how many times this government has let Ontarians down. Yep. And we are starting this session with another example of that, another policy reversal. Here's the thing, though. There are consequences. Because of Bill 124, the privatization of health care and the growth of these for-profit nursing agencies has absolutely exploded. Speaker, Ontarians want reliable, publicly delivered health care, not a publicly funded revenue stream for private companies. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. If the government is going to continue backing up the policy train this session, can they make reversing their privatization of health care their sure. next signature policy reversal? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, I, I want to be very clear what the Leader of the Opposition is asking for. She is asking that 17,000 people who received cataract eye surgery and minor eye surgery yeah. last year are still on wait lists. That is what you are asking for. When Premier Ford announced Order. the expansion of cataract surgeries in the province of Ontario in January of 2023, that meant 17 thousand people are back reading to their children, are back volunteering in community, are back driving their vehicles. That's what we are doing to make sure people are looked after in the province of Ontario. Supplementary question. What I'm asking for is for this government to stop wasting billions of dollars lining the pockets of private health care shareholders. operating rooms and our emergency rooms remain empty. Speaker, the government has had to backtrack on almost all of their major policy decisions because they met with tremendous public opposition. The green belt grab, unilateral mun municipal boundary changes, the disillusion of Peel, license plates you can't read, cuts to public <laughs> health during a pandemic, all bad ideas that we warned you about. Right on. At this rate, 
They are going to spend more time reversing their own legislation than taking the actions that would make life better for the people of Ontario, the people that they were elected to serve. So, Speaker, back to the question. Premier. How many reversals, how many flip-flops, how many backtracks does he have to be forced to make before he realizes that his insider's first agenda is failing Ontario? Members will please take their seats. Premier? Back five and a half years when we walked through the doors, found out it's a bankrupt province. The highest cost, electricity costs, the, the, the highest regulations and red tapes. I'll tell you what we had to do, Mr. Speaker, to create the environment and the conditions for companies to come here, which we're leading North Order. America in. We are an economic powerhouse now because of our policies. $28 Order. billion dollars of EV investments. $20 billion of tech, life science is $3 billion, but the greatest thing is, Mr. Speaker, we've created more manufacturing jobs here in Ontario than all 50 states combined. That says it all what we're doing here. We're making sure we're reducing the cost in the red tape by a, a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. But another great thing, since we took office and the Liberals and NDP chased 300,000 jobs out of this province because they were going to the service Response. sector, do you remember that? Well, there's 700,000 more people working today than there was five and a half years ago. That's what we've done. Final supplementary. Speaker, and uh, one in every 10 people at a food bank. That's the legacy of this government. That's the legacy of this premier. The reversals don't stop, but neither do the new and the very flawed policy. I want to take for a moment the plan to sell off our critical services at Service Ontario to yet another American big box corporation like Staples and Walmart. Ontarians are so on to you. They are so on to you, and they can tell that this is another privatization scheme, Speaker, that is going to make corporations richer Order. and not serve the people of Order. this province. So my question is for the Premier. How exactly did Staples get a sole-sourced contract to open Service Ontario kiosks? I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. And to respond for the government, the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our ministry officials took the opportunity with expiring contracts at some Service Ontario locations to reach out to a dozen potential retail partners. This is part of a tradition that goes back a century. Every party that has ever formed government here at Queen's Park has embraced and expanded the private service delivery model to the point where we now have 71 per cent private sector delivery models in this province, and it works. And The retail partnership model has proven so successful with Canadian Tire, IDA and Home Hardware that we've expanded it. Longer hours, up to 9 p.m. on weeknights, more parking, more accessibility, abilities to make uh, appointments online so you can get in and out of interacting with government in just 15 minutes. And of course, all day Saturdays, 9 to 5. This is what Ontarians have embraced and appreciate. It's about convenience. It's about putting the customer, uh, the customer first. The people of Ontario come first. Spons. That's why we're doing this. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I'm going to go back to the Premier again uh, with this question. Speaker, it would be easier to take the government's word on these matters if they had a better track record, frankly. Yeah. And the truth is that this is a government that has been mired in scandal and controversy, desperately trying to bury records, all so they can put their friends and insiders first until they're found out. Yeah. And with that in mind, Speaker, I'm going to give the government a chance to be a little bit more transparent again. So since the legislature was last in session, Speaker, to the Premier, Ontarians want to know how many government officials, including ministers, staff, and staff in the Premier's office, have spoken with the RCMP as part of their investigation into the Greenbelt scandal. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that's a question uh, better asked uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, authorities. Uh, we're continuing to uh, to work uh, with them, Mr. Speaker, but at the same time, we are continuing to focus on things that matter to the people of the province of Ontario. Look, there is no, there can be no confusion about the fact that we inherited a housing crisis in the province of Ontario. We've heard that from former Liberal ministers who have been testifying Order. in front of the Regional Government Review Committee, who talked about the crisis that was created under the previous Liberal government. Now we're undoing those obstacles, Mr. Speaker, and we're seeing month after month after month the trend is continuing in a very positive way, despite, despite the high inflation, high interest rate policies of a federal Liberal government bent on hurting the Canadian economy. We're seeing strength in the province of Ontario. Now, these are the same policies, of course, federally that we saw here in the province of Ontario, colleagues. You will know this. High interest Spons? rates, high inflation, out of control debt, spiraling costs for the people of the province of Ontario. That is what we've put back on track. We're ensuring that people have jobs and opportunity, and we will not stop on that mission, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, it's clear we're not going to get any answers to that either, Speaker. Yeah. The Greenbelt grab was an $8.3 billion scheme intended only to carve up vital resources in the province of Ontario for wealthy developers with connections to this government. Mm -hmm. And I will remind everyone in this room again, they are being criminally investigated by the RCMP for that scheme. It has cost this government at least two cabinet ministers. An RCMP investigation, I will remind you again, is underway, and we are still no closer to improving access to affordable housing in this province. Yep. Today in Ontario, housing starts are down from last year. The cost of housing is skyrocketing, and rents are worse than ever. Encampments have become the norm in most cities. Speaker, will you finally act? Will the Premier Question. finally act and support our proposal to build the affordable non market housing that people desperately need and bring back real rent control? <laughs> Members will please take their seats. Order. 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 The opposition will come to order. Minister, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, there is, uh, can be no doubt that when we came to office in 2018, Ontario was facing a crisis uh, largely as a result of policies of the previous uh, Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. Policies that, of course, are uh, underway in, in Ottawa, high inflation, high interest rates policies which have made it difficult to build homes. However, Mr. Speaker, because of the policies of this government, we are seeing month after month after month housing starts continuing to increase in the province of Ontario. In fact, we Order. have met our target for last Last year, Mr. Speaker, and the year has actually started off very strong. But the trend line is a very important one, and we're going in the right direction. I'm very, uh, very happy about that, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to purpose-built rentals, in fact, more purpose-built uh, rental starts have happened under this government's watch than at any other time in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker. In the history of the province, because what we're trying to do is end what the what the NDP and the Liberals did for 15 years. We're trying to end NIMBYism, make sure that we make the most use out of the investments that we're making in transit and transportation. We will meet our targets, we will reduce obstacles, Mr. Speaker, and we will restore Ontario to the best place to live, work, invest, and to raise a family and to ensure that all Ontarians have the dignity and the opportunity to have the same dream that Response. millions more did. That dream was lost under the previous Liberal government. This Progressive Conservative government will restore it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say a heartfelt welcome back to all my friends and colleagues in the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Residents in my riding of Thornhill have been extremely vocal about the need for more infrastructure to support the rapid and consistent growth of Ontario's population. So in 2018, our government promised to get people moving and better connected to communities across the province. We're keeping our promise and building new highways and road and transit. But, Speaker, please tell me uh, what, at this time, these projects, th these projects, just, they just can't come soon enough. Uh, speaker, can the minister please explain what steps he's taking to build infrastructure faster? To reply to the government, the Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And the member from Thornhill is absolutely right. After 15 years of the previous government neglecting their duty to build infrastructure, transit, and highways across this province, our government is getting it done, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our population is growing rapidly, over a million people in the next two years, and we need to build that infrastructure now. That's why in 2019 our government made it a priority to introduce the Building Transit Faster Act to ensure that we can better connect the people in the GTAH and faster. And Speaker, we know that more transit is needed today and it couldn't come soon enough, whether it's highways or transit, our government is committed to building Ontario, which is why later today our government will introduce legislation that tackles unnecessary delays and makes it easier and faster Response. to build, Mr. Speaker. We are the only party working for, to save Ontarians' money while fighting for fast and reliable infrastructure. Here, here. The supplementary question, back to the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and his solid work for the people of Ontario. I'm so excited to hear about the details of the announcement as commuters literally cannot wait to see more critical infrastructure built. So, Speaker, we know in order to ensure Ontario remains the best place to live in Canada, to work, to raise a family, we also need to ensure that costs remain low for Ontarians. People in my community and across this province need stability and certainty. Speaker, can the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to make more life affordable for the communities and businesses? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you once again uh, to the member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, we know that families are seeing costs go up everywhere, from grocery store to the gas pumps. That is why, if passed, this piece of legislation will fee uh, freeze fees on driver's licenses and Ontario photo cards. Mr. Speaker, this will help Ontarians save money, over 60 million over the next couple of years. Mr. Speaker, but we're also giving commuters more certainty by permanently banning tolls on provincial highways, Mr. Speaker. We know we are the only party standing up for Ontarians. We are the only party focused on making life easier for people and building our future. That is why we have removed uh, the vehicle vowel tags. That is why we have reduced uh, taxes by over sure. $0.10 cents on per litre at the gas pump, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we will always continue to fight for the people of Ontario and keep costs down. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery, this month, 11 small business people in Ontario were told they would lose their business. Their Service Ontario contracts were ripped away without a tendering process and handed to Staples, a big box American corporation that is in the process of laying off staff. These businesses were then sent a threatening email telling them not to speak to the media. What followed was an interview between this minister and Richard Southern from City News that can only be described as a dumpster fire inside a train wreck. This minister couldn't produce a business plan and was not aware of the cost or basic details of the sole source contract. When will this government stop pandering to big box corporations and apologize to small business owners who feel they've been slapped in the face? Members, please take their seat. Reply, the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My ministry and our government are always looking for alternative service delivery models, building on a century of private sector delivery models. Small business will always be part of that, but the retail partnership process is also such a great success with the extended hours, with the convenience and the community hubs associated with it. And every single location that was due to expire anyway, every single one of those employees is eligible for employment at any one of the retail partnerships, including that of Staples Canada. So this is good news for Ontarians. They welcome the longer hours, up to 9 p.m. weeknights, all day Saturday, more accessibility, more parking, and the convenience of online booking. That is interaction with government that puts the customer first, the people of Ontario come first every time with Service Ontario. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, through you to the Premier. Uh, Claudia Savona, a small business owner in Welland, 
received an email from this government closing her business. She had invested $40,000 of her own money and operated her business for 23 years. Now this government will pay Staples to renovate their big box store, leaving Claudia out in the cold. She also received a threatening email warning her not to speak to the media. But she told City News she feels she's been treated like garbage and said, and I quote, I've been a PC member my entire life. I've stuck by them my whole life. I'm finally done. Did the Premier have prior knowledge that small business owners like Claudia were going to be used and abused in this manner, or is this yet another example of incompetence in the offices of the Premier and his Cabinet? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Mr. Speaker, as I've indicated, the small business model is a key part of the service delivery model for all Service Ontario locations, but not, not one size fits all. And so when existing locations were due to expire anyway, that created an opportunity to look at possibly expanding the retail partnership model, which our government did. Order. And the people of Ontario have welcomed that. And as I've indicated, there are no job losses whatsoever on the government side, and everyone on the private side have the opportunity and are eligible for employment at the extended hours location, uh, locations of the nine Staples Canada locations. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. When the Liberals were in office, Ontario was known for its high tax, overly regulated and uncompetitive business environment. Companies that were here left in droves and companies abroad would not even consider Ontario as a place to expand their businesses. Thank Thankfully, when we got in office, we immediately reversed course. We are tearing down the unnecessary red tape that the Liberals put up. As a result, we've seen investments flood in from across the globe. I understand that the minister just came back from a trade and investment mission to India, where he spoke with companies who are intrigued by what Ontario has to offer. Speaker. Can the minister Question. provide an update on how Ontario's mission to India went? Mr. Applied, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. In this tumultuous world, our message to India was clear. The fundamentals in Ontario have not changed. Our value proposition has not changed. In Mumbai, we met with Piramal Pharmaceuticals. Now, they produ produce ingredients for cancer, eye, and kidney disease treatments in the members' riding. They invested $4.7 million to modernize their plant uh, in Newmarket, Aurora. We joined CMS Technologies to announce their brand new Toronto office, 150 brand new tech workers. This comes on the heels of other announcements from XL Scout, BSIT, both who are opening tech facilities in Toronto, creating hundreds of new jobs. Speaker, companies from across the globe Response. are choosing Ontario to invest and expand. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his uh, answer. And I'm thrilled about the growth of my local business, Paramount Pharma Limited in Aurora. And it is great to hear that once again, Ontario is open for business. And that is exactly what happens when you listen to businesses and foster the conditions for them to succeed in. We've added nearly 700,000 jobs wow. since we took office. And the investments the minister highlighted mean more good-paying jobs for communities across this great province. Under our government, we will never go back to the days of the Liberals' high-tax policies. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on why companies in India and abroad are choosing Ontario to invest and expand in? 
Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we reminded Indian businesses that all of the fundamentals are still in place here in Ontario. Lower taxes, lower electricity rates, less red tape. Businesses there see Ontario as this beacon of hope. We told them last year, Ontario created more manufacturing jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined. <laughs> We're leading the nation in job creation. Last month alone, Ontario added nearly 24,000 jobs. That's because companies in India and all over the globe know that Ontario has everything that, Ontario, that businesses need to exceed. So unlike the Liberals, high tax, high cost regime, we will continue to create the conditions Spons. to attract more companies, Speaker, and bring even more good paying jobs to our families. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, I'm joined by former patients of a family doctor at Tattle Creek Family Health Team. They, along with 1,600 other patients, were left scrambling when their family doctor moved to an executive health private medical clinic called MDD Direct. MDD Direct charges patients an annual fee of up to $4,995 a year to see a doctor. The Canada Health Act is very clear. Canada health care providers are prohibited from extra billing and user charges for medically necessary services like primary care. My question is to the Premier. Does the Minister think it is legal that patients are being required to pay $4,995 a year to see their family doctor? To reply. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, um, Speaker. Are you going to snipe or are you going to let me answer my question? Order. Just, just asking. Um, thank you. You know, we uh, two weeks ago were able to announce 78 new expanded primary care practitioner teams. that announcement, Speaker, we actually also um, set aside an investment of $20 million for existing primary care multidisciplinary teams in the province of Ontario. Speaker, would I, would Premier Ford like to do more? Absolutely. The challenge is that we had a previous Liberal government that actually cut medical seats in the province of Ontario. So we are now dealing with a shortage courtesy of the previous Liberal government. If, we, if they had not cut those 50 medical seats, we would have 200, almost 300. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you. I did not hear an answer to my question. My question back to the Premier and the Minister of Health. I am worried about the Conservatives' push for a two-tier healthcare system. It is distressing and dangerous for people to be without a family doctor, yet there are 2.2 million people in Ontario who do not have one. Ontarians should not have to go to busy emergency rooms to get access to basic care, and they should not have to pay $4,995 a year to access their family doctor. My question again to the minister. Does the minister think it's acceptable for patients to be required to pay $4,995 a year to see their family doctor? Mr. Pell. Again, the Canada Health Act is very clear that you cannot charge, no practitioner can charge for OHIP covered services. Now, Order. the member opposite is talking about the need for extended and added services in our primary health care space. Order. I absolutely agree. Ontario actually leads Canada in terms of individuals who are matched with a primary care practitioner, but I know that we can do more, which is exactly why we have expanded 78 new expansions of primary care practitioners. It is something that we have not seen in the province of Ontario since multidisciplinary teams were started. And yes, there are primary care expansions in Toronto. There are primary care expansions in Sault Ste. Marie. There are primary care expansions in London, in Woodstock, and on and on in Innisfil. Response? We know 
that we want to make sure that everyone who wants a primary care practitioner can get attached to one in their community. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Once again, the Conservatives are only showing up when it's convenient for them. Many of us on this side of the House have been advocating all day two-way Milton Go service for years, and the federal government offered to provide funding for this project three years ago. The Minister's predecessor declined that offer, but it's obvious that this government is only reversing course on that Order. because of the upcoming by-election in Milton. Milton. It appears that the only Order. way to get this government to invest in a riding is to have the PC MPP jump ship from their caucus. Oh. And don't get me started on how much time the Premier has spent in Mississauga since December 3rd. My Speaker, can the Minister explain Order. to the people of Milton Order. and Mississauga why they have had to wait this Question. long for the government to move forward with all the service on Milton Line? <laughs> To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, 15 years of the previous Liberal government, Fair. absolutely nothing got built in this province, Mr. Speaker. This government undertook the largest investment in public transit under the leadership of this Premier. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? That Liberal member voted against every single one of those transit investments every single time, whether that's the Milton Go, whether that's a Scarborough subway extension in her own riding, Mr. Speaker, in her own area, voted against that multiple times. When the member has introduced one fare, uh, the Minister from uh, of Associate Minister of Transportation introduced one fare. Those members over there voted against that every time. Mr. Speaker, we put more money into public transit. There's one common theme. The Liberals do not vote in support of it and don't support our investments that we're making across this province. We're seeing record population growth, Mr. Speaker. Our government is getting it done, and we're getting shovels in the ground, and we will take no lessons from the previous Liberal government that did nothing. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. The House will come to order. 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 Start the clock. Supplementary. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, I will say again. There's an RCMP investigation on its way. This government likes to boast about their investment in public transportation. Meanwhile, Ontarians don't see any results. My constituents in Scarborough know all that too well. What they mention less is how many of those projects have been in place for years and have only delayed under the Conservatives. Go train electrification delayed indefinitely under the Conservatives. Hamilton LRT cancelled by the Conservatives in 2019 Order. before they did what they are best at and reversed course a year later later. Eglinton crossed down. They wouldn't even give the people in Ontario an update on that one. Still no word on all their two-way go to Kitchener from the government. And the Milton service is only happening because one of their MPPs wanted to escape from the Premier. Order. Mr. Speaker, Question. will the minister clarify what they will actually deliver these product projects that are started over years ago? Order. Order. Minister of Transportation can reply. Let's take a look at the record of this government. Shovels in the oh ground on goodness. projects like Ontario Line. Shovels here, here. In the on the Scarborough subway extension, oh. Mr. Speaker. The largest rail infrastructure investment in this entire world, Mr. Speaker. That's the leadership of this Premier. That's the record here, here. of this government. We will stand on it every single day. Mr. Speaker, We've seen rapid population growth in this province. 15 years of absolute neglect by the previous Liberal government has left us in this position of gridlock all over this province. But we're building Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We've introduced legislation to make sure we can speed up the process of building, uh, building subways and transit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just look at Scarborough. That member 
That government had 15 years to act for the people of Scarborough. They did absolutely nothing. It was this Premier and the members from Scarborough Order. that committed to investing in Scarborough Order. and building transit there. Mr. Speaker, when we look at the Milton, when we look at Gold Rail, that, uh, the previous Liberal government did no investments to make sure that we could have better transit for the people of Milton and Mississauga. Our government is delivering, and we will keep building. The next question. The member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. The restaurants and hospitality industry is essential to our province economy and labour market. People employed in this industry work day and night to provide high quality service and experience for Ontarians and tourists alike. Unfortunately, Unpaid trial shifts and punitive deductions are still commonplace for workers in the sector. Speaker, this is unacceptable. Our government must ensure that workers in the service industry are well supported and their earnings are safeguarded. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is delivering better protections and bigger paychecks for Ontario's workers? Thank you. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. It's so nice to be back here with everyone, and thank you uh, for that, to the member for that important question. Uh, speaker, I think yesterday on Family Day, many people likely spent a lot of time with Ontario's fantastic uh, restaurant and hospitality workers, and I'd like to thank Kelly, uh, Tracy, and the incredible team at Restaurants Canada for the work that they do. In fact, it's 400,000 diligent workers in Ontario's service sector who get up each and every day uh, working hard, and that's why, Speaker, we've tackled uh, to implement significant measures to support them. In our la latest Working for Workers bill, we've introduced measures that, if passed, will disclose salary ranges and job postings, ban unpaid trial shifts, and prohibit wage deductions for instances in, like Dine and Dash. Speaker, this is important measures we're taking in place to ensure that we stand with these great workers who help make our precious time with friends and family worth it. And I want to thank them for the great work that they do. This government will always have their back. And thank you, Speaker, for the question. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I'm pleased to hear that our government is taking a solid stand to protect the hardworking individuals in our service sector. These dedicated workers often face long, unpredictable hours with high stress and financial instability. And they don't deserve to have their wages deducted or see themselves put in harm's way. Our government must do all that we can to ensure service workers are paid what they are owned while having a safe and healthy environment to work in. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is ensuring all workers have every opportunity to earn a good living and provide for their families? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you to that incredible member. I look forward to hopefully joining him in his riding at some of the great restaurants that are there, Speaker. And I want to touch on two other measures we're taking. Uh, one, uh, Speaker, we're ensuring uh, that the disclosure of policies related to sharing of pool, uh, pool tips uh, in restaurants, Speaker. That's another important measure we've heard from workers is important and empowering those workers to take home more of their tip pay. You know, Speaker, we've seen in many restaurants they use apps on your phone now to access your tips, and that's taking deductions off of the hardworking pay of these workers, Speakers. That's why we're empowering them to select where and how those tips get deposited into the bank accounts of these hard-working uh, workers, Speaker. But I will just close on saying, you know, for these workers to work, you actually need to create the conditions for Response. jobs. And that's why our government has worked so hard. You've heard from Minister of Economic Development the incredible conditions we've put in place to attract these high-paying jobs in Ontario that support our hospitality and service workers. Those Thank you. The next question, the member for Muskegawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The PCAB report that the Minister of Education attempted to hide and it influenced the funding for the University of Sudbury is very clear. The 
university meets the criteria for re to receive funding even goes beyond that criteria. Premier, explain to Franco-Ontarians why do you continue to refuse to fund this institution? Are you simply completely indifferent to the needs of the Franco-Ontarian community in the region? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. But let me be clear, this government has done more for Francophone post-secondary education in Ontario than any previous government. We stood up not only one, but two Francophone universities. But let me be clear, the Ontario government was never directly providing funding to the University of Sudbury, as it was never a standalone uh, institution. But, Mr. Speaker, when the proposals were submitted to make the University of Sudbury a standalone uh, institution, our government did a thorough assessment uh, and concluded that it did not reflect the current demand, the enrollment trends, or the existing capacity of institutions offering French language programs in the Greater, Toronto, or greater Sudbury area. Look, over the past five years, domestic enrollment at Francophone uh, language education universities has declined by 30 per cent in Ontario. So at this point, it would be irresponsible to stand up a third institution. And a supplementary question. <clears throat> it's like with answers with this that the community has no respect for this minister. The report revealed that the minister had already said yes to the University of Sudbury for funding. My question is the following. Who went beyond the authority of the minister to re remove that funding for the University of Sudbury? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that question. But as I said, over the years, domestic enrollment of Francophone education has been decreasing in, uh, in Ontario. So it's absolutely irresponsible for us to to stand up another institution. We have done more for Francophone education in this province. We respect Francophone education and giving students the opportunity. We stood up not only the University of uh, Ontario Francais, but also the University of Hearst, so two standalone universities. We are giving students the opportunity to study in Francophone education in this province. That's why we are supporting sectors like Health Human Resources by ensuring that College Boreal has the opportunity for standalone nursing not only in Sudbury but also in Toronto. I also had the opportunity with the Minister of Education to announce more French language teacher positions right here at the University of Ontario Francais. So we are doing more for French language university in this province than any other Response. government has in the past. And we will continue to be responsive with the taxpayers' dollars. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, I want to welcome everyone back, especially my new colleague from Kitchener Centre. My question is for the Premier. Your government is not getting it done when it comes to the housing crisis. Instead of building homes ordinary people can afford, you've wasted time and money on backroom deals for speculators. I've put forward a common sense bill to quickly build more homes and lower costs without expensive sprawl onto farms, forests, and wetlands. Speaker, will the Premier say yes to legalizing housing by ending exclusionary zoning so we can build, as of right, fourplexes and four-story homes that people can afford in the communities they know and love. Once again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, address the, the member's question. Uh, the member knows, I've said it uh, on numerous occasions, and given his proximity to uh, previous Liberal members in the previous government, he will know that we inherited a, a housing crisis uh, ostensibly because of the obstacles that were put in the way of building homes across the province of Ontario. Now, part of our housing supply action plan since we came into government back in, uh, in 2018 has been to remove those obstacles, and we are starting to see month after month uh, progress on that. Housing starts have continuously increased. Uh, I'm very confident that we will have met our, our target for uh, last year, and we have seen some strong results uh, in January, despite the fact that uh, uh, a federal Liberal government uh, with uh, high inflation, high interest rate policies has obviously caused uh, uh, some challenges. We will overcome those challenges, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to build uh, a strong uh, foundation for building more homes across the province of Ontario and more homes across all Response. categories. That's why we've been so excited by what we're seeing on the purpose-built rental uh, side, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We're going to double down and we're going to continue to make progress because all Ontarians need us to do that. Thank you. 
and the supplementary question. Speaker, respectfully, the minister's claims don't match up with the everyday reality people are facing. Times are tough. Rents are going up, housing starts are going down. Young people are tired of waiting. They are tired of working two jobs just to pay the rent. Tired of being in their parents' basements. Tired of driving until they qualify for a mortgage. They're losing hope that they'll ever own a home. Rosie rhetoric will not get it done. Speaker, will the Premier say no to speculators by saying yes to homes people can afford, legalizing fourplexes and four stories as of right in neighborhoods across this province in the communities people love? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, I certainly wouldn't call the actions of this government over the last number of years rosy rhetoric. In fact, we're seeing housing stars continue to increase uh, month after month, and we're seeing progress certainly on purpose-built uh, uh, rental, Mr. Speaker. We have the highest levels in the history of this province. In fact, a very good friend of mine, a young, uh, young gentleman who's just starting off his, his career, Nicholas Quadrini, was talking to me just the other day about the importance of giving him the opportunity to be able to buy a home. It is a dream that his parents have had. It's a dream that on have come to this uh, province uh, for Mr. Speaker, but this is a member. This is a member who talks about the costs associated with buying a home. This is a member who supports a carbon tax. This is a member who votes in favor of every single obstacle and tax that is in the way of people buying homes. The result high inflation, high interest rates. That is what is forcing people out of the market, Mr. Response. Speaker. We are going to do our best to make it more affordable, but more importantly, we're going to remove the obstacles that have gotten in the way of building homes, and we have been doing that, and we're seeing the results of that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. We all know that the federal carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone in the province of Ontario. Families and businesses across the province already feel the carbon tax's impact on their energy bills every single month. With another increase shortly approaching, people are angry that the federal government continues to ignore their concerns. They think it's unfair that the pause on the carbon tax doesn't apply to over 70 percent of Ontarians that use more environmentally friendly forms of energy like propane and natural gas for home heating. The people of Ontario deserve to be treated fairly. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact that the next carbon tax hike will have on Ontario? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member opposite for the question. April 1st is the date of the carbon tax increase by the federal government, and that's no joke, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's not just a carbon tax that's costing gas customers more. It's driving up the price of everything, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture knows just as well as anybody that it's driving up uh, the cost of fuel for tractors. It's driving up the cost of fuel for drying the products as they come off the fields. It's driving up the cost of all those trucks that are transporting to the distribution centers and then the cost of the trucks to get them to the grocery stores, Mr. Speaker. It's driving up the cost at the grocery stores, Mr. Speaker, because they pay carbon tax too. There's one party in this legislature that's opposed to the carbon tax, and that's Doug Ford and the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. And on April 1st, we have to, as a group here in this legislature, pressure the federal government not to cause an increased affordability crisis for the people of Ontario and for the people of Ontario. The supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Our government has been speaking up against the carbon tax since day one. We knew that this punitive tax would increase the cost for everyone in our communities. The unfortunate reality, Speaker, is that it's only going to keep getting more expensive because the federal government and opposition parties here want to nearly triple that tax by 2030. They are actually happy to see this tax go up once again in April. Speaker. Can the minister please explain why Ontario families cannot afford the tax hikes that the Liberals and the NDP are planning? Thank you. Order. Minister of Energy. 
Mr. Speaker, again, on April 1st, the federal government plans up driving the carbon tax and making life more affordable for not just the people of Ontario, but for people right across Canada. And, you know, while the NDP have waffled around a little bit on whether or not we Waffles should be removing uh, the carbon tax off the price of gasoline and home heating fuels, Mr. Speaker, one party has remained steadfast in their support for the federal carbon tax, and that's Bonnie Crombie and the Liberal Party of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, members have stood in this House from that caucus and said that people of Ontario and people of Canada are better off as a result of having a carbon tax than they are in eliminating that carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We will stand every day in opposition to this crippling carbon tax that's driving up the price of not just gasoline. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. According to the final report on the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, your government is failing on every measure to make Ontario barrier-free by 2025. Perhaps it's not surprising, then, that your government hid this report for six months. Frankly, it's unacceptable that you aren't going to reach this target, and it's unacceptable that you have been hiding the truth. You owe people with disabilities an apology, and you owe them action. Will the government finally agree to work with the AODA Alliance and make Ontario barrier-free for the nearly 3 million Ontarians with disabilities? Thank you for the, the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. driving change in Ontario every day. The feedback provided by the fourth legislative review is a great example of how the Ontario is continuously working to identify barriers to listen to the feedback and make Ontario accessible. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that we are doing what was asked. Thanks to the feedback from the fourth legislative review, our government is taking action on new initiative that will provide direct experience on AODA issue for people with disabilities. This is exactly Spots. what the AODA meant for us to do. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Your government pledges equity in education, but the ministry doesn't set or track standards. Support for every single special needs student is undermined every time this government cuts funding to education, and it has cut funding again. Six months ago, your Minister of Education was again asked by Ontario parents of visually impaired children to address the serious shortage of positions for teachers of blind students in our schools and substandard training for them. They have not yet seen any action or received a response. Will Premier, will you direct your Minister of Education to meet with this parents group, solve this problem that has festered for over half a decade? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, we are doing what the AODO meant for us to do. Our government is taking action in new initiative that will provide direct experience on AODA issues for people with disabilities. We are building evacuation plans for all government buildings to ensure safe evacuation of people with disabilities. We'll ensure all government procurement complies with the AODA. We are using recommendation from the first legislative review to achieve and exceed the goals of the AODA. We are getting it done. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, my question is for the Attorney General. Now, thanks to the Liberal carbon tax and inflation, cost of living is out of control, and for many families in Ontario, the cost of programming is actually the biggest barrier in accessing physical activity programs for their children. Organizations like the Jay's Care Foundation, Toronto-based registered charity, 
work to level the playing field for children and youth in the country. Over the years, kids in our province have enjoyed the safe and accessible programs Jay's Care offers to build friendships and develop recreational skills. Speaker, it's important our government continues to support initiatives that enable children to stay healthy and active. Speaker, can the Attorney General please share our government's efforts in helping Ontario youth get active through collaborating with the Jerry's Care Foundation? And to respond, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague from Brampton North for his question. McGregor, Improving the health and well-being of our next generation has been our government's priority since day one, and we remain committed to doing so. Last Monday, the Minister of Long-Term Care and I joined our provincial colleagues in Halifax to announce the expansion of Blue Jays Care to Nova Scotia. That's awesome. Our government is pleased to support the charitable works of the Jays Care Foundation and this interprovincial framework that expands access to the Jays Care 50-50 raffle. It's a raffle that uses the power of sport and play to improve the lives of youth across the country. This is the first time Canadians outside of Ontario have been able to take part. This is a model that is a first in North America, Mr. Speaker, and I'm proud to say that this type of work can only be done when we come together as a team. Now, Speaker, our government's leading the way in helping more young people stay active and act and healthy in their everyday lives, Mr. Speaker. Our announcement in Coal Harbour Fonts. last Monday, along with Minister LeBlanc, is a first of a kind. I'll have more to say in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, Gosh, Speaker, I think I'm so excited to be with my colleagues. I called it the Jairs Care. It's, it's, a, it's a Jays Care. Just want to clarify my record. Uh, and, uh, and I want to thank the Attorney General for his response. It's great to see our government demonstrate outstanding leadership in connecting more children and youth to sport and recreation opportunities. Physical activity plays a significant role in strengthening kids' overall, uh, overall well-being. However, many families are not able to enroll their children in sports programs due to financial constraints. Uh, Jay's Care creates programs that are accessible and provides pathways for kids to enjoy sports and play with their peers. I encourage everyone in this house to learn more about the Jay's Care program and how you can help one more kid uh, build their happy and healthy future. Uh, speaker, can the Attorney General elaborate on how this historic deal supports Ontario's children and youth in sports? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I sure can, and thank you to the member from Brampton North for the question. He's a steadfast advocate and leader in his own community, Mr. Speaker, and so it's great to see his enthusiasm for this historic agreement. And that's what it's all about, Mr. Speaker, the children and our communities. And affordability is an issue these days, Mr. Speaker, and this will help. Building strong communities and improving the lives of people, Jay's Care supports 59,000 kids in Jay's Care's programs just last year alone, Mr. Speaker. And in 2023, 2,399 coaches and leaders were trained, 15 more baseball fields were refurbished or built, and the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. This interprovincial agreement will allow more people to get involved in the big game, whether you're in Ontario or down east of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. You can participate and support more kids and youth in sports. Speaker, by expanding access to Jay's Care 5050 in Nova Scotia, the Jay's Care Foundation is supporting our mission Response. and likewise the great folks in Premier Houston's government. Mr. Speaker, I think there's no doubt we hit this one out of the park. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand the member for Kitchener Centre has a point of order. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my guest today. Uh, our constituency team, our fresh group, uh, Courtney, Patience, and Ada are joining us from downtown Kitchener. And uh, my dad, Brendan Clancy, is here. My kids, James, Deidre, and my husband, Ryan. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m.